In this video, we are going to get hardhat unit testing set up. So let's start a new hardhat project. You will want to make sure you select either create advanced sample project or create advanced sample project that uses TypeScript because this will configure the unit tests for you, which is convenient. If you use the basic project, you're going to have to do that manually. So let's create an advanced project. And then just hit yes for everything. Okay, let's see what we have here. And if we look under contracts, we see that we have something that will return a string. And if we look under test, which has been created for us, what it's going to do is instantiate the contract and deploy it and check that the return value is equal to hello world. Then it will later set the return greeting, wait for the transaction to get mined, and check that the message is now in Spanish. So let's see this in action. NPX, hard hat, test. And there it is. Obviously, this contract is pretty simple and not very interesting, but this is the workflow for testing. Now we will test this on something more realistic and really get into the details of the kind of testing that this framework enables you to do. The first concept that I want to really help you understand is the difference between testing view functions and functions that change the state of the blockchain. So if we look inside of this test, you will see that the greeter function, which returns the string, that's this one over here, the greet function, which just returns the greeting, is a view function. And the way it's tested is that you simply call expect and wait for the string to come back and compare it to the expected output. However, when you interact with set greeting, the pattern is different. And it might seem a little bit weird at first because it seems like you're waiting for it twice. So what exactly is going on here? Well, first of all, when you set the greeting, that's creating the transaction. So if you were to look at this set greeting transaction, if we print this, you'll actually see a transaction hash in it, which we'll do in a second. And that's like when you send a transaction to Etherscan and it says, okay, your transaction is pending. We know the transaction hash because we can create a link for it, but the transaction has not actually been accepted by the blockchain yet. This await over here is you waiting for the blockchain to actually accept the transaction. And then we call the greeter function again, which is simply a view function. Now, what might be confusing is if we skip this step, oftentimes the tests will still work. So I've commented it out, saved it, and run it again, and it passed. So it doesn't appear to make a difference if this is commented out or not because I just run it and everything works fine. Well, the reason for that is because the backend chain that we're using in the hard hat testing environment updates instantly. Every time you send a transaction, it just mines a new block. But that's not realistic, however. You, whenever you're building real Web3 applications, you should always be following the double await pattern. So I suggest that you follow it inside of your test. Now to wrap things up, let's show you the transaction hash. Like I said, I would console.log set greeting. And this is going to spit out a big object. Okay, this is what a normal transaction would look like. One is, here's the actual transaction hash. Here's the block hash on the test block chain that we were using. And here you can see the gas that was specified for the transaction. And it was being sent to this contract, which if we look at the transaction hash of the contract, that's what we'll see. And this over here is the signature. And this is the data that was sent as part of the transaction. So this is the hex encoding of the string that we sent in order to set the screen to what we wanted it to be. Okay, let's see that smart contract just so that we can get a better intuition of what's going on here. So again, if I open up the contract and then console.log the greeter, then it's gonna give us some information about it. Okay, so the greeter is, this is the bytecode of the smart contract. And Here's the address, that 5FB thing we were looking at from earlier. And if we go back into the past, that's where we sent it to. But just to summarize what we've learned, if you have a state changing function, you need to follow this sequence. One is creating the transaction and then waiting for it to get mined. If you are just looking at the state of the blockchain, that information gets returned to you right away. In this video, I'm going to explain the boilerplate that you're going to be seeing everywhere, just so that you're familiar with what it is. So Chai is a JavaScript testing library that gives you various ways of making assertions. And it's pretty common to use the expect variation inside of Chai for the Ethereum testing, so we'll just stick with that. The other interesting thing you might see is that Ethers is not actually being uh, required from Ethers. 
This is what you would normally do inside of your web application, but over here we're using hardhat. Now the reason that we are doing that is because this will enable us to have some more functionality to manipulate the blockchain. We'll look at this later about how you can test different timestamps and test different block numbers and change the balances on different addresses. Of course, you cannot normally do that inside of the normal ethers.js library because if a JavaScript library gave you that kind of um, administrative privileges over the blockchain, that would be a serious problem. But we need to actually manually manipulate the blockchain state sometimes to make sure that our smart contract behaves the way that we think it will under different states. The other pattern that you will see all the time is uh, getting the contract factory and then deploying it and just waiting for it to get deployed. Now, pretty much everything we're going to be doing from now on, uh, and you're going to see this a lot, is we would rather do this outside of the it, inside of a before each function. And we will have an async function, which is going to do this. Now, the reason for that is because each individual test, we want it to have a fresh state. So if the smart contract has gone through some states, we don't want the state changes to bleed between the tests. So we want to recreate the smart contract. And we would typically do that by saying let contract is equal to null and then we will replace this uh, with contract and this with contract and I like to call this contract factory over here just to make this a little bit more general and now everybody has access to the contract well greeter just got changed here so I guess we'd have to change it everywhere too but that's okay you're going to see that in the upcoming videos but this gives you a clean instantiation of contract so this boilerplate is something that you're going to see all over the place and I'm not going to type it out for you each time because that's going to make the videos boring but just to review, we always import our testing library. We import ethers from hardhat because it gives us administrative privileges over the blockchain, which makes testing easier. And we like to instantiate the contract before each test happens and then keep overwriting the variable that's inside of this uh, function scope over here so that each test is starting with a fresh state. Before I get too far in explaining how this test works, it's important to understand the tooling behind formatting the code and making it nicer. So over here, you can see some inconsistency, like there's no space in this function, but there is one over here. There is no space inside of this code block, but there is over here, and it's different in this section, and so on. To make code easier to read, it's a good idea to make it consistent in terms of formatting. And Hardhat provides that with us for free. So if we go to our readme that is generated automatically, let's look at that. You can see a list of commands that they give over here that tell you how to do different things. The one we care about right now is npx eslint. So the eslint, if you come from JavaScript, you might already be familiar with this, but it's just going to make everything look nice according to a set of rules that you can modify. So if we run npx eslint test, now you can run it on all of the files in there, but this is actually going to create a huge output because I have quite a few files in there. So let's just focus on the one we care about right now, which is the big numbers file. So when I run this, I'm going to get 18 problems, which might feel kind of overwhelming. Luckily, you can just add the dash dash fix option, and it's going to fix most of them for you that it can. So when we open up this file again, you can see that the spacing has been corrected everywhere, and it's all consistent now. Okay, now what about the ones over here that it couldn't fix. Well, over here, it's complaining that you can't start a constructor with a lowercase on line 42. Let's look at that. And we see over here that, okay, this constructor starts with a lowercase. Well, we can't really fix that because that belongs to this library over here. So a better thing to do would just be to change ESLint so that it doesn't complain about this kind of a thing. So what we can do there is open up our .eslint rc.js file and then add a section for rules. And what we are going to do is well, we need to get the name of the rule we're turning off. So we're gonna say new cap, and then we will put in that and say it's off. And you can do that for whatever rule you want to switch off or to modify according to your preferences. So when we save this and run this command a second time, then we have only one problem. And now it's saying there will be a loss of precision on line 30, which is true. Uh, I say that this is a bad thing over here, and I'll explain why in the next video. But before we do that, I really want to emphasize that it's easy to make your test code look nice. And Hardhat provides a nice mechanic for this, and you absolutely should be using it. There is a similar tool for Solidity that I will explain in this video. So if we look at this file over here, we can see there is some inconsistent formatting. So rather than manually fixing it, we will use a tool that is provided, again by Hardhat, called Prettier. And 
if we run this command, it's going to check all of our JSON solidity and markdown files and make them look nice. So let's do that. And when we run it, and when we run it, it's going to find a lot of issues. So what we can do if we want to see what it would, what we can do if we want to see what it would change the file to look like, we can just run it specifically on this file. And here it's uh, fixed the formatting, but it hasn't actually altered the file. So if we say dash dash write, then it's going to edit that file. So when I open the editor, it's noted, hey, the file changed in the background. So we reload it and now it looks nice. Another third tool that I want to go over really quickly, which is simple to use but very effective, is called Solhint. And again, this is included in Hardhat. So there are a couple things that I've done wrong in this file. One is not providing a pragma version. Another one is having an argument that isn't used and also not specifying the visibility on the function. These are mistakes that lead to complexity or bugs, and bugs in smart contract are obviously a very bad thing. But we can catch a lot of these kinds of errors really quickly with a tool. So let's go back to our terminal and look at the readme, and we can see that they provide us soul hint. So this is going to look at all of the contracts, which I don't want to do for now. But most of the time, you would just be using this command. And you could have it run automatically. Sorry, let me move this to where you can see it. So you would be running this command but for now, we're just going to look at the file that I messed up. So if I run on here, it's telling me that the visibility is not set, the variable is not used, and the compiler version must be declared. When you compile your contracts, you will not always get these warnings, but Solhint will make them explicit for you. So let's fix them. The first thing you should do is see if Solhint can fix it for you. So it comes with a dash dash fix argument here. And these particular errors cannot be fixed on automatically because it doesn't know which version of Solidity you want to use, and it doesn't know what you want the visibility of the function to be, and it doesn't know why you put that variable there in the first place. But we can go ahead and fix those issues. So if we get rid of this unused variable, specify the pragma, and set the visibility explicitly, save it, and run this again, then we get no errors. So just in case you can't see what's going on because my video is in the way, if this is the command that I ran with the dash fix at the end, and it didn't find any errors because we just fixed them, so this is empty. But in general, you should be running it on all of your files, just the way that they suggest over here. So to summarize, you should always be running soul hint. You should always be running the ESLint, because that will make your tests look nicer if they're written in JavaScript. And you should always be running the prettier to make your smart contracts formatted more nicely. Okay, now we are ready to study the actual testing. So I've created a contract that's not too different from the greeter function earlier, but it uses numbers, and this introduces a quirk that you should know about. So over here we have a function where we can set the number, pretty straightforward, and another function where we get the number, not too different from the greeter. Over here, we have a function that will allow the user to set it to the maximum value that can be stored inside of a uint256. So this is the solidity syntax for doing that. So to test this function, we will create the contract before each run as usable, so we get a fresh contract that is a good practice to make sure that you're not carrying state between tests. And when a variable is initialized for the first time, it defaults to zero. So it's reasonable to test that this function is returning zero when it first runs. So to make it clear what's going on, I'm going to put a dot only in front of this it statement over here, and it's only going to run this. These other tests will be ignored. So when I go back to my terminal and do npx hardhat test test slash big numbers dot js and run it, it will pass. The problem here is you were not actually comparing the same types because if we look at what's coming out of here, then we will see this is not actually an integer. So let's run this again. It's actually a big number. Now, what's a big number? Well, the problem with JavaScript is it can only represent numbers that are up to 2 to the 53rd power minus 1. But Solidity can go as high as 2 to the 256 minus 1. So that's a lot of room for overflowing if you try to represent Solidity numbers in JavaScript. You should never use regular numbers when you are testing in JavaScript. You should be using big numbers. And that's what we do up here. We import the big number in, and you can see the different places that we are using it. That's why the contract was called big numbers, in case you were wondering. So the reason for that is that it allows us to test numbers like this. If we run this particular test over here, we're going to get an overflow because the JavaScript runtime couldn't represent that number. So to avoid that from happening, what we do is we say big number dot from the number that we want. This is 2 to the 256 minus 1, by the way, and then put it in quotes so that it's represented as a string and it does not overflow. And then when the user sets that number to the maximum, we can test that that actually occurred by comparing it to 
the number that we think it should be. So the transaction is called to set to the max over here, and that sets number to be two to the 256 minus one. We wait for this transaction to get quote unquote mined because this is a state changing thing. Again, remember it's good practice to have this dot wait over here if you're doing a state changing operation and not just looking at the state of the blockchain. And then we can see that the number we got out of here, we expect it to be equal to this particular big number. So we will run only this one, run the test again. Um, you can't have two dot onlys in here, otherwise that gets messed up, sorry. So let's try this again, hopefully third time is the charm, and it passes. So we can see that we really are setting it to the maximum number. In this video, we're going to learn about how to test external functions that return things, and we're also going to begin to learn about how to handle addresses. In this example, we have a transfer function which returns a Boolean upon success. You're going to see this implementation patterns in contracts like ERC-20 tokens. Over here, we aren't using the from address, but that's okay because we're just using this as an example. To test it, what we will do is create the contract and then call that function to transfer between two addresses because we need to match the function signature and we will expect it to be true. So when you actually conduct a state changing transaction, then you cannot get the return value back right away. Why is that? Well, because when you send the, the transaction to the blockchain, you have to wait for the miners to mine that transaction and then you get the return value back. But that interval between when your contract is waiting inside of the mempool is a very long process. And some transactions can stay stuck in the mempool for days if the gas fee is not high enough. So the Ethereum library, Ethers.js, doesn't support getting return values as a result of that. So why would any function have a return value if it's external? Well, if smart contracts are, are uh, talking to each other, then external return values can make sense because all of those function calls between the different smart contracts happen as part of one Ethereum transaction. So a smart contract can rely on getting a return value back at each step as long as the entire function succeeds. However, if you're trying to test the external call, you can't do it. Because if we look specifically at what gets returned back here, you're not going to see the return value anywhere. So if I console.log this, and I'll have to get rid of call static, which I will explain in a second. So I save this and run it. What did I do wrong? Line 19. Oh, I'm reusing something else. Okay. Let's try that again. So here's what's coming back as the result of making the Ethereum transaction. This is something we've seen already where we have the signature, the gas, and so forth. But over here, you don't see anything that indicates a return value. Now, maybe value might be something, but this is always going to be zero regardless of what you put in there. So this doesn't help. So how do we get around this problem? We want to test our return values. That's quite important. So if we look at the documentation in Ethers.js, they have a solution for this, which is called static. And it says, rather than executing the state change of a transaction, it is possible to ask a node to pretend that a call is not state changing and return the result. This does not actually change any state, but it is free. This, in some cases, can be used to determine if a transaction will fail or succeed. So this is how MetaMask sometimes is able to predict, oh, this you probably shouldn't send this transaction because we don't think it's going to go through. So MetaMask behind the scenes talks to its node, and the node simulates running the transaction on the blockchain and said, yeah, this is probably going to fail. We don't recommend running this. That is called static when you are dealing with external functions that return things. And that in our hard hat environment is how we are able to test that the transaction actually took place. Now, note how we're not testing the change in balances anywhere, because if we use call static, balances is still going to be zero for this particular address that we are sending it to. But we are testing the return value aspect of this function. So let's get rid of this nonsense. Let's run the test again. And we see that it passes. If you check Boolean values using the conventional way in the chai library, this will actually return an error with ESLint. So if I test that file, it's going to say it expected an assignment or function call and instead saw an expression on line 16. This is the command that I run because my video is running in the way of the what's inside of the terminal. So what's on line 16? Well, this true over here is actually the equivalent of this. So this becomes a function call and will make the error go away, but ESLint doesn't detect that they are actually the same. So we just make that change, run the test and the error is gone. So when you are creating these tests, just explicitly say the equality because ESLint doesn't recognize the syntactic sugar. This is preferable to changing ESLint's configuration to ignoring this kind of an error because normally if you have an expression that returns a value that you're not doing anything with, that's oftentimes an indication that you did something wrong. 
In the last video, we hard-coded the addresses, which is not a great solution. Let's talk about the more general way to solve this. Hardhat carries with it a list of addresses that it has pre-configured. So if we say npx hardhat accounts, then it's going to give us a list of addresses. So now the next question is how do we programmatically access this from inside the JavaScript? This is documented over here, and the pattern is await ethers.getSigners. So let's see what comes out of here. This is actually a list, so I will say console.log accounts, and then let's just look at the first item. So I will save this and test it. So npx hardhat test, and then I will test the file that I was just running. So this is a pretty big object that we get back, but what you actually care about is really only one field in here, which is the address. The rest of this stuff allows the JavaScript to be able to sign transactions. So let's see what's going on here. If we just call dot address over here, this is going to be a lot cleaner. So I will rerun the test on that file. And well, it gets printed several times because the, the before each is running each time. So before each test run, it prints out this over here, which you can actually see if we do npx hard hat accounts, this three nine F address over here is the same one that keeps coming out. So this is just accessing the same underlying information. Over here, I introduce a new thing, which is how do you specify which address is making the transaction? So I specify that the address at index number three is the one who's deploying it. But let's get rid of this for now so that you can see the default pattern that you've been using. And now let's look at this contract and see, okay, the admin gets set to whoever deployed the contract. So I'm claiming that the default address that is used to initiate a transaction is the first address from the accounts list, even though we didn't explicitly specify that here. So we can see which account got set to be the admin over here just by looking at it, right? So console.log await contract dot admin. We're just getting the public variable here. So let's do this console.log. Uh, this is the admin. So we know that whatever prints right afterwards is the address in interest. Okay, this is the admin is again that first address in the sequence. Okay, I'm going to undo this because this is definitely not what I want to do. In this situation, I'm connecting with the deployed ID. Now notice with the connection, I am not saying dot address over here. This will cause things to break because an address cannot sign transactions. It needs the rest of the information about the account. So let me get rid of this. Okay, now let's look at what the actual test looks like. This shouldn't be surprising because it just gets an address back and then expects it to be a string equal to the address that deployed it. No surprises there. And again, we are calling dot address over here. If we get rid of the address, this test is not going to pass because a string is coming back, not an account object. Now, unfortunately, we don't have an address type, but we can still check that it's a string just to make sure that we didn't do something dumb like not return something at all or return an integer. But the part of this test that's actually interesting is rejecting addresses that are not the admin. So this is tested by connecting to the contract with an account that is different from the one that deployed it. So here we've specified this account to be associated with what we call an attacker ID, which we are calling the fifth index. And the attacker connects and attempts to call the function change admin to his own address, which is over here, change admin. This person is calling the function and trying to change it to his only address. And we're hoping that this will block it. And it turns out it does. But what does a block look like? Well, the function ends up getting reverted because under the hood, the require statement is going to issue a revert command into the Ethereum virtual machine and revert the transaction. Now you could technically just test it with this to be reverted and that will work, but I don't think that's as good a quality test because you want to actually test the error message that's coming out. And that way, if you accidentally change the error message, you'll be alerted to it. So let's put that back. We want only admin to match the message that we have over here. Now, what is this revert reason thing over here? Well, it turns out that there's an issue with the hard hat library right now that is currently open at the time I'm recording this. What the person noted is that you can have a revert message that uh, begins with the same prefix and it will cause the test to still think that the revert message was correct. So the solution that's proposed inside of this thread is to add a function called revert reason, which prepends the error with this string that the library always creates. And if there is a mismatch, unless this reason string matches exactly, then the test won't pass. That's okay. That's not a catastrophic thing. It's just something that you should know about. But the important part is that when you are testing for require statements, you want to check that one, you actually get the reversion that you're expecting and the transaction not going through. And then two, the sort of reason for that reversion. And the flip side of this test is testing that something did not get reverted. So you can explicitly say when the 
person who really is the deployer is trying to change it to a new admin, then we expect it to not be reverted. Now, this is nice because otherwise, without this check over here, sure, you could um, just run this thing and not check anything and then check that the new admin is actually the new admin the way you updated it. But this is a little bit more thorough and a little bit more explicit about what your intents are. So over here, we are creating an assertion that will cause the test to fail if this is in fact reverted. So we've covered two things in this video. One is this is how we test for functions that we want a revert to happen on. And this is how we state that we don't want the function to get reverted. So let's run the test and we see that everything passes as expected. One thing that might look kind of funny in this video is that the await statement is outside of the expect. Now, this might seem kind of strange because we would expect that this sequence is an asynchronous uh, call. So why is that? Well, again, when we are looking for a revert situation, at the moment a transaction is initiated, we do not know that was reverted or not because it's waiting in the mempool. This is something we discussed with the external functions. So you will not get back inside of the JavaScript library the outcome of your function, whether it's a return value, whether it got reverted, whether it emitted an event as we will look at in the next video or whatever. So that's why inside of this testing library, we're waiting for the entire transaction to complete. And then we can look for whether or not a revert happened. And this is being handled at the testing library level. So just to review, there are three patterns that could happen when you need to set up your asynchronous function. One is you are making a state change and you are not checking for any side effects or any return values. In that situation, we're just getting the transaction back and then waiting for it to get mined. And the second pattern is we are doing a read-only function. So we just wanted to check that it returned the string that we care about. And then finally, we are checking for side effects. In that situation, we put the await on the outside and put the function call to the smart contract inside of the expect statement. And then on the outside, check if it was reverted. And the testing library will handle the asynchronicity for us. Now we will discuss how to test if our smart contract is emitting events the way that we expect it to. This is important because one, if you accidentally delete some code where a message is being emitted, you want to catch that in your test case. And certain EIP specifications say you actually need to emit certain events in order to be compliant. There's two different kind of events that we can test for. One is an event with an argument inside of it, and the other one is an event without an argument or it could have multiple arguments, but the pattern is somewhat obvious in that case, so I won't belabor the point. Here is what the test looks like. We call the function that we are testing, and we expect it to emit the name of the event. So this important message here is simply what we declared over here. And we expect it to have arguments with account zero dot address. Now remember, we didn't specify which address was connecting to it, but we know that the first account is the default one. And we've dis we discussed this pattern in an earlier video over here. And just like the last video, the await is on the outside because we can't look at the return value of this and say, hey, was an event inside of there or not? Because we don't know in real life when we are going to get that return value back. That's why it needs to be wrapped inside of the testing library to handle that bizarre case for us. And then we conduct the await on the outside. The case for the empty message is simple. We can just say with args following the same pattern above and put nothing inside of it and the test will pass. So we will run this code and we see both tests pass. The next thing that we are going to test is change of Ethereum balances in externally owned accounts and in smart contracts. So the smart contract that we are going to be testing here is very simple. It takes a deposit via this payable function and simply stores in a mapping how much Ethereum the user has deposited to the account. If they make multiple deposits, then this will simply be incremented and correctly track the value. Withdraw will set the balance back to zero and send the amount of Ethereum that the user has put into the contract back to them. So to test this contract, we want to make sure that the balances are changing as we expect them to. The first new principle that we're going to have here is the ability to force an account to have a certain amount of balance. That is done via this API where you attach to the provider, which I'll discuss in a second, and make an RPC call hardhat underscore set balance and the address that you're trying to set the balance of as well as the amount of ether that you are trying to do. Now, this specification specifically requires you to use hexadecimal. So there are a couple utilities that are provided as part of the ethers library. Utils.parseether will turn this into the appropriate amount of way. 
Remember, Wei is the default unit of Ether, and there are 10 to the 18 Wei inside of Ethereum. Now, this interface specifically requires hexadecimal numbers, and the RPC protocol doesn't allow you to have leading zeros. So you also need to remove the zeros, which are in the utils over here. Okay, this by itself is already a lot. So let me console.log what is going on here just to make things clear. So when we have parse Ether, what we are going to get back is a big number that corresponds to the appropriate amount of Wei. So this is Ether, and we will get this. And then when we convert it to hex, it's pretty straightforward what will happen at that point. And then we will remove the zero. Okay, let's run this. This is printing redundantly because it is inside of the before each function. But what we see here is 20,000, but this is much bigger than 20,000 because this is in units of way. When it's converted to hex, it happens to have a leading zero over here. And when we remove this leading zero, this is the form that it's in. If you do not remove the leading zero, then this step will fail. So provider is what gives you the interface for manipulating the blockchain that we are running locally. There are, you could actually get provider via this mechanism, await ethers.get default provider, and this is what you might do inside of your web app. But if you do this inside of your hard hat environment, it will connect to the main net and your tests will not work as you expect them to. That is instead why we use ethers.provider and it will point us to the hard hat one. I know that's confusing, but that's why I wanted to spend some time talking about it. Okay, now let's look at how we are actually going to test this. So I will remove these. And initially we expect the contract over here to have a balance that's equal to zero. Now remember, we need to use big numbers even though zero will not overflow inside of JavaScript. The next check that we have is that the wallet involved here has the correct balance of 20,000 ether. All right, so from the provider, we are going to get the balance of the smart contract address. And of course, after it's initialized it, we expect it to be zero. So this is a very good sanity check. And we also expect the initial account to have 20,000 ether in it. Now, Hardhat actually does specify a default amount of ether for each of the accounts. I think it's 10,000 ether if I'm not wrong, but it's good to explicitly set it so that you have a very clear picture of what state changes are happening. Okay, over here, I've designed a test that fails, which I've put the X mark in front of it to cause it to skip. Here's what's going on. We are going to connect to the contract with account zero, and then we are going to deposit half of the 20,000 ether. And then we will wait for the transaction to get mined. And then we will, at least in theory, expect the smart contract over here to have 10,000 ether and the original account to have 10,000 ether. But if I run this test, it's actually not going to pass because we see that we are off by a very small amount compared to our target of 10,000 ether. Why is that? Well, that's because Hard Hat is also simulating paying a gas fee, which you can configure, but this is also a factor that you're going to have in the real world, so I wouldn't recommend actually turning it off. How you can get around this is something I discussed in the withdraw function. So the withdraw function behaves the way you expect it to, so I'm not going to belabor that. But you can have a utility called close to under the... Um, expect result and you can check that okay when we withdraw the ether we expect to get everything we put into the smart contract back so we get our original balance which is 20,000 but there will we're going to have a bit of a tolerance here of 0.01 .01. so that means we know that we were close and this accounts for a certain amount of gas being missed in the last video users could just deposit and withdraw ether at will which isn't very useful Usually people deposit Ether for the purpose of staking or providing liquidity, and they lock up their Ethereum for a certain amount of time for providing the liquidity. So to implement a time lock, I've added some more things that are stored inside of the struct. One is we check how much the person stored as expected, and the other one is when they last deposited. So when somebody deposits, we increment their balance just like last time, and then store their last deposit time as the block.timestamp. So if somebody deposits right after, this will simply get updated to the newest block.timestamp. And then we want to check that when the withdraw time happens, we are at least uh, more into the future by the amount of duration. So the now time minus the last time they deposited needs to be at least one day, according to this configuration. And if they pass this check, then we will set their balance to zero, or rather delete any record of them being here, and then we will transfer them the balance. Now to test this, this could be a little bit tricky because we don't want to actually wait a day to see if this logic is working. So we will use a time lock. Okay, now on to the testing. I'm not gonna go over this line by line because we've already covered a lot of this material before. 
Just for the sake of convenience, I've added a constant called small ether, which allows me to account for the Ethereum loss paying for the gas. The first test we have here is what we would expect it to be. We deposit 100 Ethereum into the contract and expect that the contract has a balance of 100. Okay, no surprises there. Let's move on to the time change. First of all, we want to check that if people withdraw early, then the transaction will revert. So our account connects and deposits 100 Ether and we wait for the transaction to get mined. And the smart contract has 100 Ether in it. We follow up right away with connecting to it and attempting to call the withdraw function. And we expect it to be reverted with cannot withdraw yet. And that is the error message that we have over here. Obviously between this execution and the deposit that happens over here, this is going to be a lot less than a day. So let's look at withdrawing after one day. The first, to make sure that the balances are moving around correctly, we get the original balance of the user. And we will store this for later because we want to check at the end when they withdraw that they are back to where they originally started or close to it. Okay, so we deposit, and this is the interesting part, EVM increase time. So again, we are connecting to the provider like we talked about in the last video. Make sure that your provider is in the test network and not the main network. And we do the RPC call EVM increase time, and we set it to be one day, which is 60 seconds times 60 times 24 gives us the amount of seconds in a day, and we add one second to make sure that it is more than a day. And then when we call withdraw, it is not reverted. But the key line in this video is pretty simple. This is how you increase the time. And if you have a time lock inside of your smart contract, this is absolutely something you can test because it's easy to put bugs in time-based logic. Over here, we've created a smart contract that will illustrate manipulating the block number for the purpose of testing. So in an earlier video, we talked about how to advance the timestamp. And in this video, we're going to talk about how to advance the block number. Now, most of the time you should be using a timestamp rather than a block number because a timestamp is a much more reliable indicator of how much time has passed instead of a block number because the time between blocks can vary. And when Ethereum goes over to proof of stake, it's, the block time is going to considerably drop from where it is now. Block number Numbers are usually appropriate when you're using a commit reveal scheme. That is when people make a commitment at an earlier point in time and then have to wait a certain amount of time to make sure that that commitment can't be changed. So this rather silly contract illustrates this concept. In this contract, people are able to bet one ether uh, into the smart contract. And at the point of 10 blocks into the future, if that block hash um, ha it converts to a number which is even, then they get their ether back. Otherwise they lose their ether. And of course, if the smart contract doesn't have any ether in it, then even if they win this, they won't get any ether. So this is a very stupid game, but I wanted to make it simple so that we can make the points clear. Even though this contract is rather simple, it has a lot of corner cases because you want people to make sure that they're only trying to claim winnings ahead of the required number of blocks, but not too far ahead into the future because the block hash function only works uh, 256 blocks into the past. So we obviously need to give people enough window to claim their winnings, but not so much that the contract stops working. Because if you call block hash on a block that's more than 256 blocks in the past, it will return a zero and zero modulo two is zero. So people will always be able to win. And the other situation that we're checking here is we don't allow people to make too many bets in sequence. Once they've made a bet, they have to wait until the max blocks ahead parameter has passed. So there are actually a lot of situations to test. We were we are also going to use this contract as a segue into measuring code coverage and branch coverage, which are extremely important metrics when evaluating the quality of your tests. So first, let's do a, the simple test. What we are going to do is just test that the gamble on the 10th block function works. So it should accept one ether. Now, in order for this test to work, we have to first advance the blockchain at least a thousand blocks or so into the future. Well, why is that? Because this cooldown time, if we assume that the person hasn't bet before, which is true, this will return a zero. But max blocks ahead is 110. But block.number, when a hard hat just begins, testing starts at zero. So zero will not be bigger than this constant over here, and the test will not pass. So we can illustrate this by me commenting these lines of code out and then testing it. So npx hard hat test test block number.js. Reverted wait for cooldown time. And over here, that's the issue inside of the require statement. So let's move this back so that we don't run into that issue. Okay, and the test passes. Now, something's interesting here. We didn't actually test anything. See the expect over here is not used anywhere inside of this file. So the first thing that we want to look at is 
okay, we, we wrote some tests, but how good are these tests actually? Now, the way that this is usually done is by looking at coverage. So if we look back inside of the readme that the hardhat creates, there's a script called npx hardhat coverage, which we are going to run. What coverage will do is it will run all of the tests inside of uh, your test folder, which is looking at all the files we've been looking at through this video series. And here we see a report of how much coverage our files have. You will see four metrics along how the test coverage is evaluated. One is statements, branches, functions, and lines. So a, li a statement can go over several lines. So you will you, you can see some variations between these two numbers. But the and functions and functions is simply the percentage of functions that got tested. The interesting one though is actually the branch code. And over here you can see that this is very very low. So what is meant by this? If you look inside of the directory that you're in, you're going to see a folder called coverage and within coverage here let me clear this so we're looking coverage and then if we look inside of coverage slash line coverage report i believe that's what the l stands for you're going to see a website that was created for you over here which has html js and css and if you open the index.html file inside of your terminal it will open whatever browser you use and here you can see that table from earlier presented in html form so we are interested in block number and here we see it highlighting where the problems are one is is claim winnings wasn't tested. So it's highlighting this in red, but remember this is all one line technically. So over here, this we can basically say that this function isn't being tested at all, which makes sense. Now, the interesting thing over here is it says, hey, um, this function was tested because there aren't any red lines over here. So that means the test coverage affected the lines that are inside of this function. But what are these E's over here? Well, E means that there's an implied else statement. So it, yeah, if you hover over the mouse, it says else path not taken. So it says, yeah, you executed this, but you didn't see what happens if this requirement isn't met. And you didn't check what happens if this requirement isn't met. And you didn't check what happens if this requirement isn't met. So the lack of checking these branches means that you don't, you, the actual functionality inside of these alternative scenarios hasn't been tested. Now, a good quality smart contract, in my opinion, should have a 100% in all of them. Now, is this true if you were building like a web app or some uh, thing that, you know, you could just make funny face filters on, you probably don't need 100% line coverage for something like that. But smart contracts are typically responsible for managing millions of dollars in cryptocurrency, or sometimes currency that represents real currency. Well, I shouldn't say it's real currency, I guess crypto is real too. But the point is, you're dealing with a lot of money. And any area that isn't tested is an area where things could go wrong. And this isn't even beginning to illustrate the full picture of the quality of your tests, because at no point do we check the balance changes. Even though this is a payable function, we didn't actually check did the balances change that we the way that we expect them to. So just because you have 100% coverage over here doesn't mean you've actually tested everything that you care about, because these tests are not sensitive to other state changes like, did you change the balance? Uh, did you emit, emit an event? And so on. However, this at least is a sanity check because it checks that you've actually tried the different combinations that could actually happen. So in the following videos, what I'm going to do is try to get the branch coverage up. And I'm actually not going to finish testing everything because I want to leave that as an exercise for you. But what we will need to do is add some more tests that are going to get those branches to be tested. The particular thing that we learned in this video is how to advance the block number, which you can see here. I don't think I need to explain this too much. You're just asking hard hat to mine 1000 blocks and that will move it 1000 blocks into the future. And then that enables us to actually call the gamble function in order to actually test this, we're going to have to move the blocks forward again. And that's what we're going to do in the following videos. To increase the coverage, luckily we have a very good graphical report of what's going on. So let's pick an easy one. Here we see that we have an else condition over here that isn't actually being tested. So we can test this just by sending something other than one ether to the contract. Let's try that out. We'll copy this and we will change this to say it should reject. 1.1 ether, and we will change this to be 1.1, and we expect this to be rejected. So this we will expect contract, like, like so, to be reverted with revert 
reason. And what's our reason? Not degen enough. Well, maybe this would be more appropriate in saying that it's less than, but let's say we want exactly one ether. Okay, now we will need to bring in uh, that function we discussed earlier. So I'm just gonna copy it from over here and put it on the top and save this. So let's run coverage again. And now we see that the branch coverage has gone up to 33% from 25. So when we go back to the report and refresh the page, that else case disappears. The next situation we can test for is the contract not having enough balance. Let's move this inside of these tests like this, and then let's create another test which says it should revert if the contract has no ether or less than one ether. Otherwise, the contract is not able to pay out to the user the bet that they are making. So we will simply get rid of this, and then we will change this to be the correct amount, but the revert reason changes to can't gamble with you. And we paste that, save this, and run coverage again. Now coverage is running the tests again in the background, which is how it's able to get an updated test report. You can see the test running over here. Looks like our test failed. Okay, so how come this failed? Well, there, this is actually a funny situation here. This will always be true if somebody sent in one ether. So now that I'm pointing that out, it's kind of obvious. But before you actually run the test, this might not be the case. So this is actually a good reason to run unit tests. Now, what we were probably checking for is did the contract already have one ether in it? And should it have been two ether? Or do we consider that the ether they're depositing it is good enough because we're, we may or may not return it to them later? I would argue that this is probably a redundant check, but this is why you unit test your contracts because you can discover redundant assertions that way. Finally, we're going to test the situation where someone is trying to deposit twice within the same window. So let's make that copy here and someone will mine. So the blocks will get moved forward. Um, so the transaction will get mined and then we'll move the block forward again one more time and then expect our transaction to get reverted. So let's move the blocks forward by one and then expect this to be reverted. This is just to make sure that people aren't changing the state of the smart contract while another bet is in progress. So we will copy this, put it in here and change this error message. Oh, we didn't get rid of the old test. And we will rerun the coverage. Okay, so if we were to look at where we can need to continue our work, so now we can see that all of the branches have been covered in this function, which is a good thing. Just keep in mind that the test didn't explicitly check the uh, balances of the contract, so that's an area for improvement. Next, we would move on to this function over here, and we would want to make sure that one, all of the lines are covered, and two, that all of the branches are covered. But this is what you want to see, something that has all of the lines covered and all of the branches covered. In this video, we're going to summarize everything that we've learned. To make your tests effective, the first thing that you need to do is make sure that every state change is explicitly tested for. Common state changes include changes in Ethereum balances, whether in the user account or in the smart contract, an event that was emitted, or changes in storage variables. Try to be precise about these, so either look for exact Ethereum balances or something close to it modulo the cost due to gas. For events emitted, it's preferable and highly recommended that you check not only that an event was emitted, but also what was included as an argument inside of that event. The other thing is aim for 100% code coverage and branch coverage. Now, I understand that unit tests can be a source of contention in the general uh, software development world, but in the context of smart contracts, I think this is a very reasonable requirement. The cost of a mistake can be quite catastrophic, so going through the extra hassle of covering that last few sitting branches is worth it, and it's re a relatively cheap form of insurance. More important than code coverage is branch coverage, because these can lead to these can lead to your code being executed, but not actually testing the logic that matters. Coverage doesn't mean it's tested, and coverage doesn't say anything about the state changes like the balances. But coverage is still a useful piece of information. The other thing is when you design your test, make sure that there's no leaks between each test, because this can make your test fragile. So always make sure that the smart contract is redeployed and that the count accounts are reset so that you don't have any funny amounts of balances or some state that's being carried over from a previous test. When a function returns something, make sure you test that. And ideally, check the return type also. Don't compare the return value of integers to regular numbers in JavaScript because you might end up with overflow. So always use big numbers. And remember, testing the return value on an external function requires you using the call static. But remember that call static will not induce a state change. And finally, keep your code clean. This makes it look more professional. And when it's more clearly laid out, you are able to catch bugs more easily. So 
null hint is a very useful thing for checking for unused variables and other silly mistakes. So you should really, there really is no reason to not use it. Now it can give you a false positive sometimes, so use your head, but this is a very easy way to catch mistakes. ESLint is specifically for JavaScript, so you want to run this on your testing library to make your test more readable. And prettier is used on the Solidity code. Hardhat, when you set it up in the advanced configuration, provides all of these for free. So the quote-unquote inconvenience of using these tools shouldn't be an excuse. So good luck. I hope you've learned something about how to write more professional code and to write safer smart contracts. The customers who use your contracts will definitely thank you.